Wow, thank you, uh, everybody, for coming out tonight. I am dazzled by this turnout and um, really humbled by it, too. I want to thank my friend Carver Gayton. How old are you here? <laughs> as, you, as you can see, this is a, a long list of titles um, and positions that he's held. But in the process of getting to, to know Carver, the, the through line, I think, that you described that is the most important identity that you've had is being a lifelong educator. And, and I, I want to acknowledge that. I should also say I live across the street from Madrona Park, which apparently is where he used to hang out. <laughs> so I'll get to watch my kids do the same. OK, so what I'd like to do tonight is um, share a little bit about who I am talk a bit about my college and what I've learned about it uh, after five months on the job. We're going to spotlight two of our very cool faculty. Uh, our provost, Jerry Baldistry, is here. Where are you, Jerry? I just saw, yeah, Jer Jerry's going to offer a few remarks as well. And then we'll, we'll end the night with um, this tantalizing question or dangling clause, whatever you want to call it, of together we will do what? Okay. And I'd like to open with one of my favorite cartoons from Gary Larson, The Far Side. I'll give you a moment to read it. <laughs> Say, what's a mountain goat doing way up here in a cloud bank? I love this cartoon because it does a great job of, um, of, of illustrating the problem with faulty assumptions and how faulty assumptions can get us into trouble, sometimes big trouble <laughs> in this case, sometimes minor trouble. And it's a good segue for me to share two faulty assumptions that I grew up having. One, totally harmless. The other, not, not so much. OK, so I grew up in, um, right by San Francisco International Airport in a community called Milbrae um, in the 70s and the 80s. I'm an immigrant. My family migrated here. Um, I'm Chinese, but my family migrated here by way of Taiwan, Australia, and then the US. Um, and while many people think about SFO with shiny and modern and new, lots of glass, a lot of metal, the, the SFO that I know looks more like this. It's two-dimensional. Pan, Pan Am Airlines used to be, loom large in my mind. Um, I worked there actually for a summer job in high school. Um, I remember Pan Am uh, went away, I think, in 2000, maybe 1999. But when I, when I was growing up, it was still very dominant. And um, I remember the, the stewardesses used to come in their little hats and their little bags and stuff like that. Um, and so the harmless assumption that, that I learned growing up is that um, I believed that the sky roared in the morning. And it was because planes took off you know, right around dusk. But for, for me, as a child, I thought that was because the sky roared, that at dusk and dawn, there was some noise in the sky that made this rumbling sound. And I don't even know at what time I realized that wasn't true. Was, I think it was kind of late. <laughs> but, but for many years, I thought, oh, well, it's, it's morning. The sky's roaring. It's, it's time to wake up. Okay. I also made other assumptions growing up in the Bay Area at the time that I did. Um, I was part of the generation that really started to transform the Bay Area. Um, I know that when people think about San Francisco and the Bay Area now, they think diversity, great food, super expensive, Silicon Valley, etc. But when I was growing up, uh, kind of like when Carver's describing this story, I was one of the few Asian, much less Chinese kids um, in my class. I've, I've shared with some of you my kindergarten picture where I'm the only one. I went to a school called Green Hills Elementary. If you look at the demographics today, it's something like 44, 45 percent Asian, right? But that wasn't the case when I was growing up. I was part of the generation that was new, that was transforming the Bay Area, um, that was different. So some of the assumptions that I had growing up were that something was wrong with me because I wasn't white, that I wasn't a real American. And the reasons why I felt that way, they weren't hard to figure out. People would say that to me. People would say that to my family. At that, um, at that period in time, assimilating and, and fitting in was very important. right? And as a kid, I picked up that message loud and clear. Um, I was having a conversation earlier with one of my faculty, Filiberto. Where are you, Filiberto? Someplace in here. <laughs> Hi. So we, he, he, was one of the, he was the first guest to arrive. Yay, you, gold star. We, we were talking about just what did it mean growing up being immigrants? And you know, I was sharing the story that um, 
My middle name used to be Hui Qi. When I, my, my birth name is Duan Hui Qi. But when I was 14 years old, right around that age, my family, be, we became US citizens. And I had the opportunity to make my name legal. And I just wiped off Hui Qi because from a 14-year-old's perspective, that made good sense. Okay. So again, when I talk about these faulty assumptions that something's wrong with being Asian, something's wrong with being who I am, that also came out of that, that time period. So for me, equity, inclusion, and access is very personal. But it's also professional now. I have found ways to, um, to do the work that is very personally important to me, but to share it with others and to try to make a difference, to basically combat faulty assumptions that others have about themselves, about other people, about how the world works. Okay? And now this is my talk about how did I get here and why I'm here. Um, if you had asked me about a year ago what I would be doing, I would not have said I'd be doing this. I would have assumed that I was still at the University of Oregon, uh, serving in administration, having a five-minute commute, <laughs> having a, a fairly decent life. <laughs> That's not the case anymore. Even in Madrona, it can take me 40-something minutes to get home on some days. Um, so this was not on my radar screen. But when the opportunity became available to me, first things that I noticed were, wow, Number two, Num number two amongst publics, number six amongst pu publics and privates. That is very shiny. That is very notable. But I'll tell you the thing that made the difference for me. It was this. When I started to look at the work that the faculty do here and the core values of the college, I saw reflected back to me the things that are important to me, equity, inclusion, and access. And that the work that, the, that my faculty do is about combating faulty assumptions. Assumptions we have about immigrants, about who can learn, about the role of culture in the classroom, and on and on and on. And that's the reason why I'm here, because I believe in the work that the college does, and it makes me proud to be leading the co a college that has these other, as their core values. So my, my faculty are probably tired of seeing this slide, but I love it because it does a really great job for, of describing how I see my role. I am a sociologist at heart, I probably was trained from a child, from being an immigrant really, to notice, to listen, to pay attention to what's going on, to pay attention to who's in the room and who's not. What's the culture in a room? Who has power? Who doesn't? Who gets to speak? Who doesn't? Those are just things that I naturally pay attention to. Um, and it's been fascinating because I find that um, as a dean now and as an administrator, especially new in this role, I am an, a sociologist every single day in every single meeting that I go into as I try to understand dynamics, needs, relationships, connections to other meetings and other people. So I've brought my sociological skills to the job and I've been learning a lot over the last five months. I've been on a grand listening and learning tour with my faculty, with constituents, with students, um, everybody and anybody. My, uh, my calendar is just filled <laughs> hour after hour with lots of meetings. And I've been learning about language. Like what's the, what are, what's the, what are, what are, what's the lexicon that, that's common amongst my faculty? And one of the first expressions that I learned about from Phil Bell was this research practice partnerships, which I had never heard before because, again, I'm a sociologist who studies equity, identity, race relations, inequality, but not necessarily an educator in the way that my, many of my faculty are, right? So I learned about research practice partnerships and what that means, that research and practice are tightly coupled together and they're always involved in partnerships and collaborations with community. I learned about the importance of partner schools, and in particular, the Ackerley Partner School Network, right? So what does that mean to, to really have a partnering relationship between a college and schools and teachers to, to advance teacher preparation, teacher education, professional learning? I learned about math labs, not meth labs, math labs. <laughs> I learned about things called studio and design days, that the ways in which my faculty talk about their work. It's about creation. It's about co-creation, co-creating, experimenting, designing. Right? It's very cool language. All right, so one of my internal goals 
um, that I set out was to meet with all of my tenure line faculty first by the end of this term. And I am so happy to say that next week I've got my last one. <laughs> it's like one more. So long as you're not on sabbatical or you're not on leave, I will have met with you for an hour. <laughs> so, so I've got lots of um, impressions and thoughts and conversations that are, that are kind of cogitating and floating around that I'm kind of packaging and making sense. And what I'd like to do now is just kind of do a few slides to highlight some of the ones that, um, that, that most resonate for me and most stand out after five months on the job. And I'm just going to say this now from the, my faculty who are here. I did my best to name drop you, but then it just got too hard because I would have taken four hours going through the 20 or 30 of you who are here. So I just apologize now. <laughs> OK, so this first one, first question that I think guides the work of many of my faculty is, what keeps our kids strong? And Janine Jones, I don't know where you are, someplace in this room, she said it last week in a meeting that we were attending, and I loved it, for its simplicity and its clarity. What keeps our kids strong? And the work that Janine does is all about this question, trying to answer this question. Same thing with the work of Eileen Schwartz and Gail Joseph. I, mean, I, I could go through the, the whole laundry list. Please don't quiz me, because it gets overwhelming. <laughs> How can we prepare and support exceptional teachers? When I think about this question, I think about conversations I had with Elham Kazemi and Kara Jackson and Jessica Thompson. And because I think that there's a, a, a commonality in the ways that those three faculty approach teacher preparation and what it means to, to help create and create a culture for exceptional teachers. Um, Kat Peck, who is my men one of my mentors in the college, he's, he's also one of um, our associate deans, you know, he, he, the way he describes it is that the way that we do teacher preparation, particularly as is exemplified by those three faculty, is finding the sweet spot between bringing teacher candidates, teach practicing teachers, and college of ed faculty to play in that intersection between those three populations in ways that improve student, uh, student practice and student learning. And I just love that idea, because then I take in that notion of design and studio and labs. And, and what does it mean when you bring people from different positions to, to explore problems of practice? How is cultural, culture integral to belonging and learning? This is a key question that I think my faculty explore in various ways. But I would be remiss if I did not acknowledge one of the two luminaries, really, in multicultural education, Dr. Jim Banks and Dr. Geneva Gay, who, are, who, are, who have honored me by being here tonight. Right. How does culture fit here? Yeah, I see clapping. And how can we authentically engage parents and communities to improve learning? You're going to hear a little bit more about this from two cool faculty that I was mentioning earlier, so I'll just leave it at that. But I love this slide, and I love, I love this question. And it's one of the ones that really sticks out for me after five months on the job. And then last but not least, because I had a hard time only picking a few questions, but these were the ones I kind of I felt most drawn to, to explore with you tonight. What does it mean to be a national leader in teacher preparation? And I want to call out Ken Zeichner, who many of, in, many of you in this room know, because Ken is a luminary in teacher preparation. And he's somebody whose commitment to local engagement is, is unquestioned. But this is a question that he has helped prompt in me, that as a leader of a national college of education, what does that mean to say that we set the bar, we help frame questions, we, 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 people pay attention to how we do what we do. And I tell you, it, it, um, when I was in the interim role, I didn't feel that pressure. I feel that pressure very deeply now that it's, the interim's been erased, right? That there is this sacred responsibility in terms of whatever decisions are made or not made, okay? And really, I, I think about Ken when, when, when I wrote this question. Okay, so common threads that, that at least are clear to me after, after five months on the job. It's words like culturally responsive, equity and excellence paired together, positive impact, not just impact, but a positive impact, and then community partnerships. Okay. When I think about through lines, what binds the work of the faculty within my college, these are terms that come to mind. But I think it's also really important to acknowledge that these are 
aspirations that we have, which means sometimes we hit it and sometimes we don't. And so what does it mean for us to make a pledge or a commitment in being an equitable partner? To me, that means making a pledge that we will listen, that we will learn and we will, will respect the individuals, the organizations, the, the communities that we work with. This is an expression that my faculty said when we did retreats. We work with, not on people. We work with, not on students. And then Keisha, is Keisha? Keisha from Seattle Public Schools at a coffee meeting we had, I don't know, like a month ago, she was talking about one of our, my faculty, Elham Kazani, and how she made the university touchable. Is that how you phrased it? And I, I loved that because I understood exactly what she meant. Touchable is intimate, knowable, familiar. You can, you, there's a face, right? And I think sometimes for certain communities that have been underrepresented, the college or the university can feel not very touchable. And so it's, it's especially in the work that we do, touchability, it must be something that we strive for. And accountable. Um, again, I've been on a listening learning tour. I have heard from community members who have, who have honored me by being honest in moments where we have been less than touchable or respectful, and that's good. I want to know that. My faculty want to know that. We want to strive to, uh, to live up to these goals. Okay, and then one final story before I hand the mic over. Um, this was my graduation day, and that is my grandmother, my popo. Um, very bad perm, <laughs> but I thought it was really good at the time, okay. Uh, but, but to kind of go back, to hearken back to assumptions, and in this case, a good assumption. So my grandmother was a uh, practicing Buddhist, maybe a little manic about it, but, but she used to, on, on Chinese New Year, she'd, she'd stay up all night and in front of her altar, and she would pray, burn incense. It was the one day of the year I was guaranteed she was in a good mood. <laughs> um, but as a child, what she would do is she would um, bring me over to the altar, put me down on my, on my knees, and she would talk about me to my ancestors, right? And I tell you, she would say things like, Mia's been very good. She listens to her parents. Um, it makes me emotional. I think about this always. Um, she's, she's a good daughter. She's a good granddaughter. And I used to feel protected by that. I felt as though I'm in with the gods, <laughs> I'm in with the ancestors, but I felt blessed, right? So I had an assumption that I was blessed, and it was very culturally relevant to me. For a kid who really didn't know how being Chinese was good for a very long period of time, this was one of those few moments where it was very clear to me it was good, right? And so again, assumptions, they can be harmless, they can be less, they can be harmful, or sometimes they can get you through a tight bind when you need to.